Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to another session of PHI 215. Uh, so today we're going to be working on uh, functionalist theories of the mind. Um, so, uh, functionalism is a theory that competes with uh, the theories that we've looked at so far. Substance dualism, the identity theory of the mind, so, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to try to get a grip on the basics of the functionalist theory of mind, along with uh, Fodor's defense and Bloch's basic criticisms. And today, I'm going to try breaking the video into two parts. So what we're going to do is we're going to just get to Fodor's defense and Bloch's criticisms in this video, um, and then in part two, we're going to look to Searle's challenge uh, for functionalism and theories of strong artificial intelligence. Uh, so just to review uh, theories that we've thought about so far. Uh, remember, substance dualism is the view that mind and the body um, are two fundamentally different kinds of stuff or substances. Uh, and when we talk about substances, we're really talking about things that could exist independently of one another. Uh, then we looked at materialism, and that's the doctrine that every event in the world is physical. Now, one version of materialism is logical behaviorism, the idea that mental states are just dispositions to behave in a particular way. And we also looked at identity theory, which is the view that mental states are identical to certain states of the brain. Uh, so today we're going to be thinking about functionalism, which is the view that the mind is the functions that the brain performs. So to have a mind is just to do brain functioning stuff. So let's go a little deeper on that. It's the view that the mind is the function that the brain performs. So here is Jerry Fodor and his defense of functionalism. So he says that it accurately describes the causal role of mental states uh, much in the way that identity theory does. So one reason why you might like the identity theory is because brain happenings are just physical happenings and it explains why certain change in, changes in your body create certain changes in your mind. And moreover, why certain changes in your mind uh, can bring about changes in your body, right? Uh, but uh, maybe something that functionalism does better than identity theory is that it accurately describes the relational characters of mental properties in a way that's similar to logical behaviorism. So remember, behaviorism was just the view that mental states are dispositions to behave in a particular way. So the mental state of pain is just a disposition to wince or avoid things. Well, functionalism tries to capture this same idea. So for instance, the mental property of being in pain uh, stands in a relation to the mental property of, say, things like forming an intention to avoid something, like putting your hand on a hot stove again, or uh, to wince. But Fodor's point, and another reason why we might prefer functionalism to identity theory, is that identity theory says that to have a mental state is just to have a brain state. Well, mental states, according to Fodor, are mentally realizable. I mean, are multiply realizable, excuse me. So a multiply realizable uh, state is one that can be maybe realized in a different context or in a different way. So you might be able to set up a mental state on a computer, right? Or instead of using carbon-based life, you might have um, silicon-based life, right? both capable of having mental states. Uh, so we get this 
thought of multiple realizability. Now, the way that Fodor puts it is that by distressing the distinction between hardware and software from computer science, this hardware-software distinction, uh, by doing this, the functionalist can make sense of both the causal and relational character of the mental. Uh, so, you know, just like you can have a bit of software that's uh, realized through, uh, you know, a disk drive or a solid state drive or through the cloud, uh, just so long as they're doing the same thing, they're performing the same function. Uh, so this is what we're talking about when we talk about multiple realizability, right? Uh, so the mind is kind of like software in this analogy, right? It's the functioning, but it's not the machine itself. So here's how Ned Block tries to criticize functionalism. He says, Suppose we convert the government of China to functionalism and we convince its officials it would enormously enhance their international prestige to realize a human mind for an hour. We provide each of the billion people with a two-way radio that connects them in the appropriate way to other persons and to an artificial body. Surely such a fish system could be functionally equivalent to you for a short time, say an hour. There is a prima facie doubt, so a prima facie doubt means um, like at first glance, right, or on the face of it, right. Uh, it would seem that this system of, you know, persons with radios throughout the Chinese nation um, doesn't have any mental states at all. Right? The persons uh, with the radios have mental states, but the whole system itself doesn't have a mental state. So this is Bloch's criticism, right? And we're going to call this the Chinese brain argument against functionalism, which is a version of what we're going to call an absent qualia argument. So it says this. It says it's possible to introduce a functional organization into some system so that, if functionalism is correct, a mind would be brought into existence, such as uh, in this Chinese nation thought experiment that Bloch has given us. But it seems intuitively obvious that no mind at all is constituted. Uh, like we don't, for instance, think that the internet itself is a mind, or that a billion people all working towards uh, a function of, say, moving a body uh, is a mind. Therefore, functionalism is false, right? So we've got um, a modus, um, we've got a modus tollens argument here, right? If functionalism is true, the Chinese brain uh, would bring a mind into existence, but there's no mind brought into existence in the Chinese brain case, therefore functionalism is false. Right? And this seems to cut right to the definition of functionalism, right? Because if we can get the functions that a brain performs without actually getting a mind, uh, well, then it can't be right to say that a mind is the functions that the brain performs. So, uh, we're going to wrap this one up here, and in a moment, we will return by looking at part two, uh, where, we'll, where we'll discuss Searle and artificial intelligence.